Okay, let's continue with the talks. Just a short reminder, there's a whiteboard down in the lobby where you can sign up and vote for lightning talks. So stop there if you have time. And the next presentation will be given by Kara Noll, who is a senior manager running the virtualization team at Red Hat. And she will give an overview on virtual and physical machines and the different sorts of software. Thank you. So as you said, my name is Karen Noel. I am the group manager for the virtualization team uh, for Red Hat. I'm part of platform engineering, so we develop RHEL. I have developers on my team all over the world, and we have nine or 10 of them here today. What I want to talk to you about is the difference between physical systems and virtual machines. Uh, the topics are CPU and memory hot plug, live migration, timers and clocks, performance monitoring, and what you should do to test your application or your system code on both virtual and uh, physical machines. So I drew some pictures to show you, um, I mean, this is a typical picture of a physical system. You have hardware, and I put some some funny graphics for CPUs, those squares are CPUs, uh, some disks, some memory, some, some storage. But I'm gonna focus more on the CPU part of it. I've got the Linux kernel layer that runs on top of the hardware, and then you have user space where you run applications and various uh, Linux, various other Linux processes that run in the background. So you add a layer onto that and you have virtualization. Uh, the QMU process is what we use to, um, is the application that runs the virtual machines. And that sits up on top of the kernel. It runs in user space. The Linux kernel has virtual memory subsystem, scheduler, IO. Um, what we add is the KVM module. I hope everybody knows that KVM is a module in the Linux kernel. And QMU is the user space that runs, runs the guest OS. Inside QMU, you have uh, monitor, IO emulation, you have CPU emulation, and we create virtual hardware for the virtual machine. The guest OS runs inside QMU, actually. And inside the guest OS, this is this separate layer. You have applications that run and also other Linux processes. And you also have the Linux kernel running inside the guest OS. I also drew libvirt in the picture, although I wanted to mention that my team in platform engineering does KVM in the kernel, we do QMU, and we also do uh, para-virtualized drivers that run in the guest, and the guest agent that runs in the guest. But libvirt and everything above that in the management stack is part of the, our cloud business. But we work very closely with the LibVirt team. And in fact, all the examples I'll show you today use LibVirt, and I'll show you the LibVirt XML. Here I drew a couple of virtual machines running. So you have two QMU processes running. I drew those blue circles to represent uh, threads, or what the scheduler in the kernel would consider a task. Okay, so I drew those little circles that you have vCPU threads, you have IO threads inside QMU. It's just a regular process running inside Linux. And you can see the virtual CPUs are scheduled on top of the physical CPUs by the Linux scheduler. So just because you're running on a virtual CPU, you don't know which physical CPU you're running on unless somebody on the host pinned it or something. So you can see can, any of those threads can run any, on any of those physical CPUs. So this is what it looks like when you log into the host and you run the command line. You can do a PS, you can grep for QMU, you can find your virtual machine running because it's running as a QMU process. I highlighted a couple things. I highlighted that we're accelerating with KVM, so you can run QMU totally emulated in user space, but I wanted to show you KVM acceleration. I also highlighted that we're running a minimum of one 
virtual CPU and a max of four, because my system has four physical CPUs. I also wanted to highlight, in this example, I was running CPU host, because I'll show you some examples later that aren't CPU host. And another way to look at this, now that I've got the PID, is I can look at all the threads. So I wanted you to really visualize that this is a process running on the host, just a regular process. Some of those threads, I can't remember at the time how many vCPUs I had running at the time. Some of those are vCPU threads, some of them are IO threads. So why do people run virtual machines? Uh, I've been working with virtual machine technology for almost 10 years now with other companies and now with Red Hat. Um, <clears throat> it started out more for consolidation. So you have these big physical machines that have sort of outgrown a single app. So people wanted to put mul multiple apps. They figured out they could, um, you know, virtual machine technology came along. It was really for consolidation. Another use for it is hardware abstraction. So you have an older version of an operating system. You have apps that only work on that older version of the operating system. You want to upgrade your hardware, but that old operating system doesn't support that hardware or something, so you run it on a virtual machine, because we can emulate those older machines. Uh, more recently, it's been used like once the management layers got, uh, got more mature, it was used for fast provisioning. So now you have a whole data center of virtual machines. They pre-buy all the hardware, and then they let the different departments ask for virtual machines, and they can give them to them very fast. So another really cool thing about virtual machines is th how flexible they are. When I first started working on virtual machines, I was a kernel developer. I was actually very uh, annoyed at how slow a physical system reset took and how, how long it took to boot. Run it on a virtual machine, everything is really quick. You can do debug loops really fast. Also, a funny example here, I'll try to point out all the examples of things that are, are good and things that people have done wrong over the years that I've seen. So hopefully you guys don't make the same kind of mistakes. Um, <clears throat> with the flexibility, the funny one here is uh, a while ago, Linux took five CDs to install. Now, no physical machine has five CDs, so you have to keep uh, ejecting the CD and putting the next one in. And that's, you know, you have to babysit the thing. On a virtual machine, we just put five CD drives on a virtual machine and, you know, put, pointed all the ISOs to those CD, CD drives and just let it go. But you would never see a real physical machine that has five CD drives. It doesn't make sense. So that's an example of the flexibility. And now the most recent use of virtual machines is the cloud. And of course, the most popular hypervisor for OpenStack is KVM. Hope everybody knows that. Uh, we're also the core technology for Rev, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. So anytime you hear somebody from Red Hat talking about virtualization, you know that's KVM. Um, Open vSwitch also uses or communicates with KVM, uh, Gluster Storage uses, uses KVM. And there's plenty of other uses for virtual machines. People are um, inventing more things every day. And I think it's very important for all developers to understand the difference between a physical machine and virtual. Whether you've been developing on physical machines like I had been, or you're used to working on virtual machines, there are some newer features that I'm going to talk about that maybe you haven't used before, but I want you to be ready for them because I, I have experience um, either on physical hardware with these features and have seen examples of people misunderstanding or not being ready for these new features. So the first one is CPU and memory hot plug. This is a feature, uh, it's built into the ACPI firmware. It started with the large physical machines where to plug in a new CPU, the operator would actually insert a new CPU into the machine, and then ACPI would send a platform event to the OS. And then either OS did it automatically or an operator would type a command, 
and the CPU would come online and then you'd start using it. To unplug a CPU, um, you have to set it offline so the operating system stops using it. Whoops. <coughs> Then you call a method inside a CPI firmware to eject the CPU, and then an operator physically goes to the lab and takes it out. Now, how do you know which one to take out, and how much you're not, how, how do you make sure you're not taking the wrong one out? Well, there's usually a little flash, flashing thing in the lab. So these are the commands to uh, online a CPU and offline a CPU, it's simple um, sysfs. And this is actually what the guest agent does, and I'll show you that later. So in a virtual machine, how does CPU hot plug work? Well, it leverages all the years of experience on these really big machines where you can hot plug CPUs. So we leverage the ACPI design. So to unplug a CPU, you start by something on the host system, and in my example, it's libvirt. It calls into QMU and tells it to create all the structure that it needs for a new vCPU. Then, just like on the physical machine, ACPI sends an event to the OS. And then you can either do it manually or you can have libvirt send a command to the guest agent to have the CPU go online. And it starts working. The point is you can do it all from the host. You don't need any man manual intervention on the guest OS. To unplug a CPU, for now, you just turn it offline from within the guest. And you can do this through a libvirt command, sending a command to the guest agent. There's currently work being done upstream by one of developers, Igor, <laughs> to sort of finish this work. And we'll have the ACPI eject method, and we'll have QMU actually remove the data structures, remove the thread, so that the host OS isn't scheduling an idle thread. So I talked about the guest agent a little bit, so I wanted to show you the libvirt XML for this. And I didn't type all this myself. I had help from uh, vert manager. So I set this up with vert manager, and then I dumped the XML. And what I wanted to point out to you is the fact that it's Vert IO serial, and it's just a port. It's just a serial port that it can communicate with the guest agent. And the guest agent ships with the operating systems. So I wanted to make sure I set this up correctly, so I did some first command, this one being a ping. So this is a nice ping command, so I could see, oh, did I set it up right? Yep, the guest agent's there, everything's working. The next command is guest OS info, or guest info. And this tells me this version of the guest agent and all the commands that it supports. This is what libvirt uses to know what it can do with the guest agent. So some of the commands are get vCPUs and set vCPUs, and these are the ones that it uses for the, the hot plug. So here's my two vCPU guest. Um, I did the get vCPUs command so that you can see what it looks like. And you'll see there's two CPUs. They're both online. And only one of them can be turned offline, because you need CPU zero. So what happens when I do an unplug? The command is verse set CPUs, and I want to set it to three. So I want to add one. So I get a new CPU, and I have to do the dash dash guest command to have it actually turn it online. Or I could have manually gone into the guest OS and turn it online. <coughs> so now I have my three vCPU virtual machine and I want to unplug one. So I do the set vCPUs with the dash dash guest with, an, with, with two. And doing the get vCPU commands again, you'll see that it actually offlined, whoops, it actually offlined CPU one here. Okay, I made it red. And you can see that here. CPU one is off. So now you have CPU zero and two. But that's okay. You don't really care which one it takes offline. 
Okay, so things to watch out for with CPU hot plug that I've seen before, actual examples. Um, you have application programmers that have a daemon, they want their daemon to run very efficiently, they want to have a thread per CPU, so they want to be able to utilize all the CPUs, but what happens if you take some CPUs away? Now they have too many, and they're running multiple threads on the same CPU. If the opposite thing happens and you add CPUs, and now they don't have enough threads and they're not using all the CPUs. So you should design your application or your daemon to adjust if they see CPUs coming and going. You can either get, get an event or you can pull. Uh, the question was how do you know if a CPU has come online or been taken away? Are you dev? Um, another thing I've seen is applications that are licensed based on the number of CPUs or cores. And in a virtual machine, that just doesn't work very well. And I think, I think pretty much people have gotten away from that by now because there's been so much support in all operating systems for uh, CPU hot plug, at least the big ones. So the next topic is memory. Um, what we have now is called memory ballooning. All the hypervisors, I think, support this. Um, what it allows you to do is overcommit memory in the host on multiple CPU or multiple virtual machines without causing the host to swap. Because if you cause the host to swap, then your virtual machines start uh, running really slowly. So what, what we do to, um, the, the terminology is kind of hard to remember, but when you inflate the, uh, balloon driver that's running in the guest, it allocates memory from the guest, puts it in its balloon, so you think, think of the balloon inflating, but then it gives that memory back to the host. So that guest is actually using less physical memory. It's got this big empty balloon in it. Okay, and then the host can do whatever it wants to with that memory. It can give it to other guests, and that's the way the overcommitment works. And deflating is just the opposite. So one project we're working on upstream is called automatic memory ballooning. Uh, right now, this is all manual, unless you run some, write some scripts or you have some management tool, you know, trying to load balance memory. So we're doing auto, auto ballooning, because the kernel in the guest and the host knows if it's sort of starved for memory resources. So we have things that um, actually look for memory pressure and will inflate the balloon or ask the host for memory so that it can get more in the guest. Yeah? I guess what most of us do is have that overcommitted memory to the guest and the machine and then they have to swap it so we have more memory than we have before. So the question is how does the over provisioning work now? Um, you have KSM, which will share pages that are the same, or it's just not using all its memory, so it's sitting there just unused and it, therefore it's not being swapped. But if all your guests start using all their memory, they might start swapping. Unless somebody, if you're using some fancy management tool and it's controlling the ballooning. Because ballooning's been around for quite a while. Also, we have memory hot plug coming. So that will also leverage the ACPI firmware so that you can in-plug memory and remove memory. Now the in-plug part of the memory is the most important part because you don't want to actually, I mean it's really hard to guess how much memory your, your guest is gonna want. So it's much easier if you guess some, something reasonable and then you're able to plug more memory in. The next topic is processor emulation. So this is my host system, okay, I've got a Four CPU, Sandy Bridge, it's actually this laptop right here. Um, you'll see when you do, uh, when you look at PROC info, you'll see it's an i7-2620, okay? And you, you can Google that, you can look at Wikipedia, whatever Intel's website, you know that's Sandy Bridge. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out the flags, okay? So you have the CPU ID feature flags, Typically, the ones I want to point out that you'll see on the host, 
Oops. First one is perfmon. You'll see all the virtualization flags. Okay, EPT, VPID, these are all ones that the host uses for virtualization. Now next, I did three different uh, processor types. I did host pass-through, I did Sandy Bridge, and I did Nehalem, and I wanna show you the difference with those three. So this is the libvirt XML for the host pass-through. Now th there's been a lot of confusion about what host pass-through means. Um, some people think that every single feature of the host processor will be used directly by the guest, and that is not true. Um, so I'll show you what this looks like from within the guest. So you'll see that, actually we do have perfmon, and this is the only CPU model that we allow you to use the performance monitor, okay? And you'll see that in the next two. But you also see this hypervisor flag so that you can tell you're running in a hypervisor. So perfmon is set in both, you're missing all the virtualization features. Now, some people know there's things as nested guest, and, and you can sometimes see these, but it's only with host pass-through, and only if the host isn't using them. Okay, then I did Sandy Bridge, okay, because some people think that host pass-through and Sandy Bridge are the same thing, if I'm running on a Sandy Bridge. It turns out this isn't true either. So I'll show you what, well actually this is the libvirt XML. You notice it looks very different. I'm not doing host pass-through, I said Sandy Bridge. So I, I took out a lot of it. There's the dot, dot, dot <laughs> is libvirt saying exactly what flags it wants set. And actually I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because in two talks Eduardo is gonna talk a lot more about this. So I just wanna uh, show you these examples pretty quick. Um, notice you don't see perfmon. So any of the emulated processor types we don't allow perfmon. Of course, all the uh, virtualization is missing, but you still see that you're running on a hypervisor. So the final one I did was Nehalem, so that you can see the difference. Again, the libvirt XML defines all the bits. And inside the guest, you see, again, there's no perfmon this time. And I'm not sure if this exactly matches the Nehalem. This is what Eduardo will <laughs> explain to us. So the lessons here, like I said, don't assume that whatever processor model that you see, you're gonna see all those CPU ID flags. Okay, use the uh, proc CPU info to actually know which CPU ID features that you can use. And I think it's pretty straightforward. I think people un pretty much understand this. I showed an example where the virtual machine has a different processor type than the host but don't just assume because you see that Nehalem model that all the features of a Nehalem are gonna be supported because it could be that QMU doesn't emulate some of them yet, okay? So be really careful. And um, so the one that I've seen people screw up on the most is the PMU because typically the PMU, and I'll show more about this later, PMU has been very processor model specific so they don't look at the flags. And in fact, we had a kernel developer uh, actually program a warning message as the system booted if it didn't see a PMU. It's like, wait a minute, try a virtual machine and you won't see a PMU. All right, the, the next big thing that's different about virtual machines from physical is live migration. I've never seen a physical machine live migrate. Um, <laughs> I've heard people think they can do it, but, um, but I wanna show you some things that are different about virtual machines. This is also uh, something that, even if you've been running virtual machines, you may not have shared storage, you may not have another system to actually migrate your virtual machine to, so you may have never seen it in action. Um, even if you're running in a cloud, you may not be running with shared storage. Um, and only most recently we were able to migrate virtual machines with non-shared storage. So I think it's pretty rare um, unless you're running on RevM or something, or with Rev, that you actually have experience with your virtual machine migrating. 
So I want to show you some things that, to watch out for and some of the latest developments. So this is a picture of my virtual machine again. This one has two vCPUs. When it starts to migrate, we create a new thread. And this is something that has gone in the upstream QMU fairly recently. Uh, Libvirt will actually create the QMU on the destination host. And we'll start copying all of the memory to the other host while the guest is still running on host A, okay? It copies all the memory, it tracks which pages have been written to and been dirtied, and then it starts copying all the dirty pages and it does this over and over and over until QMU decides that it can freeze the guest, copy the final dirty pages, all the metadata, including the MAC addresses for all your network cards, so that when it starts running on the target or the destination host, you can communicate with it and it can start running on the destination. Yeah? Okay, the question was, how long does it take to migrate and how long does it take to do the switch? So I'm gonna go over what we call downtime, okay? And that's the amount of time that it takes to do the switch. And that's the amount of time that you're off the network. And I'm gonna go into that in more detail. How long it takes for the whole process, it depends, okay? <laughs> that's my favorite answer, okay? It depends on how much memory you're dirtying is the biggest one, okay? Because the majority of the time it takes to migrate is copying all that memory. Um, exactly. So there is a concept called max downtime that you can set. So QMU knows what threshold it has to meet, it knows how many dirty pages they are, there are. It's been measuring the network bandwidth. Okay, so it knows. And even if it's wrong, if it gets has to halfway through that uh, metadata final dirty page copy, if it sees that it's about to exceed the limit, it'll abort and start over. It doesn't wanna uh, exceed that, that limit. So here's the internal version of the downtime. So I have an internal version and an external version. The internal version is according to QMU, what the downtime is. And this is, the version, this is the version of downtime that you set with max downtime. This is the amount of time the virtual CPUs are actually frozen. Now, the virtual, the virtual CPUs are frozen in between instructions, okay? They'll res resume at the very ne next instruction when they get to the destination. And the kernel really doesn't notice. The kernel doesn't care. And the applications no, don't notice and they don't care. And there's some <clears throat> information that you can see from QMU if you, if you know how to run it this way that actually shows you what the internal version of the downtime was. And this, this example was done for me by a, fr a partner, a colleague. I think he had eight virtual CPUs at the time. He was running, I mean his job is really to um, <clears throat> run big workloads, run workloads that don't migrate because they don't converge. <coughs> QMU never discovers that it can, <laughs> that can freeze the CPUs. So this is kind of a, a you know, worst case. And I'll also point out that we have this auto convergence feature turned on and this is the guy that actually implemented the auto converge feature. So he wanted me to show it to you. Um, so this is the external version of the downtime. This is what you'll see from another system doing a ping to your virtual machine. So this is sort of the generic way to look at the downtime, but if you're running an application and you really wanna know, like say client server, you wanna know what client, what, what, how long it's gonna take your client to, up, um, to do something with your server, you're better to measure it with your application specific um, mechanism. But for our pur purposes, we just use ping for illustration. So the first phase of migration, uh, we ping the system, it's very smooth. It uh, takes less than a millisecond to ping, everything, everything is normal. 
and then we freeze. Okay, and in this case, the freeze was a little over three seconds, and that's what we call the downtime. And then we resume on the destination and everything works fine. Okay, we're back to our normal ping times. Yeah? Yeah, because it's really long. I just took them out. <laughs> That's because you had this. Yes, that's what you missed. OK. So I wanted to show you a version of this with the autoconverge turned on. And what we do, uh, the first phase is normal. You have normal ping time. Then we have the throttling. Whoops. So you can see how wacky it gets during the throttling. Um, but this is what it allowed it to converge so then we have the downtime, and then we go to normal again. Uh, I'm told I have to speed up, so sorry. I'll do timers and clocks real quick. OK. Uh, on physical hardware, you have a whole bunch of timers and clocks. You have real-time clock, the local APIC timer. Uh, hopefully, these are mostly familiar to people, ACPI timer. The last two are interesting, the TSC and the HPET, because they're different on virtual machines. So the way they look and work on virtual machines, RTC, local APIC timer, works fine, ACPI timer. When you get to TSC, there's, there's where I'm uh, going to start warning you, OK? Because um, the TSC, you can read it, OK? We, we don't even emulate it. You just read the actual TSC. But if you do a live migration to another host, like you're going to see a big jump, either forward or backward. And you're probably not going to like that. Uh, HPET is really slow. Um, there's really no compensation for mix, missed ticks. And if you think about what it means, high precision event timer, it's really not high precision on a virtual machine. There's no real reason to use it. I put two links up there for you. Um, there's a really good white paper by, by VMware. The concepts are very much the same. Uh, and also a presentation from the KVM forum a couple years ago about timing that explains a lot of this. So I want to explain the KVM clock, which is our para-virtualized clock. Um, but we also implemented Hyper-V's version of para-virtualized clocks. And this is for Windows guests. So basically, it's like Windows um, checks some bits, and it thinks it's running on Hyper-V. So it uses all its uh, timer, timer and clock mechanisms. So I already said, don't read the TSC directly, because the frequency, oh, the TSC frequency as well. Uh, you can migrate to a different host system that has a different frequency. So if you're reading the TSC, and you think you can time something that way, it's not going to work, work once you migrate. In fact, KVM doesn't even emulate the platform info MSR with the TSC frequency. And I've seen this in two applications. <laughs> it actually causes QMU to die. So we let you know right away that you're doing something bad. Um, so we really need to use KVM clock and use standard functions because Linux underneath will use the KVM clock. And it has nanosecond um, <coughs> accuracy. Another warning I'll give you is to use NTP in the guest. So with live migration, you have some downtime. Usually it's not as high as the three second that I showed you. But it will adjust the time, OK, because you do miss some time. Uh, it also compensates for clock drift. It's got really um, sophisticated algorithms in there. And it'll adjust for leap seconds. <laughs> Some internals about KVM clocks. So I was curious, you know, am I using KVM clocks? I didn't even specify it. So there's, that's how to tell if you're using KVM clock. There's a structure in the kernel that you can look up called PV clock vCPU time info. And I actually looked, at, looked it up and talked to the developer who works on it to find out exactly how it works. And it's very complex. Um, the fields in that structure, I mean, I didn't even want to show them to you because it's way too hard to explain. But basically, it keeps some fields so it knows the offsets okay, from the TSC, either between two physical CPUs or between two hosts. 
And to compensate for the frequency, there's a couple more fields so that it can do the right calculation. It also keeps um, something called the version number, which, um, or the version field, which is actually the migration embedded in there is the migration count. And it actually compensates every time it migrates the virtual CPU to a different physical CPU. So it knows that. Most recently in the 3.7 kernel, um, we did an optimization of vSyscall so that um, normal Linux uh, calls like get time of day work really, really fast. So the KVM clock page with that structure on it is mapped into the guest operating system and you don't even have to trap into the kernel to get the time of day. So it's, it's really fast. And that will be in RHEL 7. Okay, performance monitoring. Like I said, traditionally each processor model has its own PMU. On recent Intel processors, they define something called the architectural PMU. So there's a subset of PMU events that are now on every single Intel, pro Intel processor. Um, this is only available when you have CPU host, which is uh, host pass-through like I showed you. If you do a perf list, the very first set that are in the hardware events, th those are the architectural PMU events. So some warning here, warnings here. Um, we don't actually prevent you from using non-architectural PMU events when you do host pass-through. Uh, many of them won't work quite, quite right. I mean, you'll try them, they'll seem to work, but you might get funny results. And a good example that I put on there is the uncore events. And the reason I use that example, it's pretty easy to see that your virtual CPUs aren't lined up on the host the same way, so that uncore events sort of don't make sense in the virtual machine. So I already went over live migration. Okay, so what we've done, or the developers have done, <laughs> is to make sure that you can only use the PMU if you do host pass-through. Um, Libvirt will actually disallow live migration unless the um, processor type on the destination host is identical. So you can still do live migration. So if you're sticking to the architectural events and you do, do live migration, everything should be fine. Okay, so in conclusion, I wanna talk a little bit about testing. Um, if, if you're doing things that are very close to the hardware, you obviously have to test on physical machines but we like you to test on virtual machines as well, just to make sure, like the uniprocessor, uniprocessor example, that there are no unintended consequences of what you're doing. Uh, we can also do device assignment, so you, even if you're use, use, working on a driver, we can pass that device right up into the guest OS, and it's really important to test on a virtual machine. Um, I highly recommend testing on virtual machines. They're cheaper, um, they're more flexible. So here's some of the you know, variety of virtual machines that you can create. You can create from one to 160 virtual CPUs. So you can test um, all kinds of things. Now, if you create more virtual CPUs than you have physical CPUs, so watch out for uh, things not working very well. Um, and we only recommend, you know, the number of virtual CPUs as the host has physical. You can do from 512 meg up to four terabytes. Now, you have to have a, a host system that has at least four terabytes to have a guest that has four terabytes. Otherwise, you're going to have to heavily rely on KSM or ballooning or swapping so make sure you have a large swap file or you do a lot of ballooning, but this can help you test some of those larger memory limits. And with the emulated processor models I showed you, you might be testing on virtual machines, but the administrator may have only set you up with one type that matches the host. So uh, test, test with all different processor models and definitely try testing with live migration. 
tests with different workloads, tests with different network topologies, set the max downtime to different values. Basically, understand your application and what it can tolerate for a downtime. Because you're going to want to make those recommendations to um, your users so that they know what max downtime to set, say, in Rev or in OpenStack. And that's it. Uh, do we have any time for questions or am I done? <laughs> okay, no time for questions. Um, I'll take questions outside, I guess. And we have two more talks in this room about KVM from two of the developers. And we also have a, a talk uh, by another KVM developer at the, in the slot after that, upstairs. <laughs> Thank you.